Kia ora everyone and welcome to this Goodfellow webinar on asthma and evidence-based approach. I'm Dr Louise Kugler and tonight I'm talking to Professor Richard Beasley. Richard is a physician at Wellington Regional Hospital. He is the Director of Medical Research Institute of New Zealand and Professor of Medicine at Victoria University of Wellington. He is an adjunct professor at the University of Otago and visiting professor at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. Previously, he was the Deputy Chair of the Health Research Council of New Zealand and is currently the Chair of the New Zealand Adolescent and Asthma Clinical Guidelines. I'll hand over now to Professor Beasley. Kia ora, Richard, and welcome. Kia ora, Louise, and thank you very much for that introduction. And good evening, everyone. Thank you for giving up your evening to attend the webinar. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to present to you tonight. And the task I've been given is to discuss how we might practice evidence-based medicine based on guidelines for asthma. Now, before I start, I would like to uh, mention my conflicts of interest that I've received research funding from a number of pharmaceutical companies, as well as some personal fees, uh, and that I'm chair of the New Zealand Adolescent and Adult Asthma Guidelines Group. Now I'm going to discuss four, sorry, six key topics that are shown in this slide. Diagnosis, how we should keep it simple, particularly in this time of COVID and influenza uh, in the clouds. Uh, that budesonide formotol is preferred to a short-acting beta agonist as a reliever therapy, a recommendation that's can been considered as the biggest paradigm shift in the management of asthma for many decades. Inhaled steroids are in, SABA only treatment is out. And in terms of implementation, how we follow a stepwise algorithm as a framework and utilize asthma action plans for their implementation. And then finally, I'll discuss the concept of personalized medicine and how we might use the treatable traits approach. And I'm going to base my presentation very much on the New Zealand Adolescent and Adult Asthma Guidelines. And in doing so, I want to acknowledge the really strong multidisciplinary team that put the guidelines together. Uh, the guidelines were are practical, they're evidence-based, and they're designed primarily for primary care. They've been published in the New Zealand Medical Journal as shown on the slide, and they're also available as a download from the Asthma Foundation. In terms of the evidence that I show you, it's primarily going to relate to um, high quality meta-analyses, systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials, and the randomized controlled trials themselves that are at very low risk or low risk of bias. So the evidence that's going to be presented is going to be a very high level, which means it can be translated to a high level of recommendation in terms of clinical practice. And so I'd like to start, first of all, with diagnosis. Um, I do not need to tell you as general practitioners how to diagnose asthma in clinical practice, because I'm sure you're all very familiar with this and experienced. But what I briefly want to mention is why it is now considered not necessary to require the demonstration of bronchodilator reversibility with lung function testing to make the diagnosis of asthma. And I'm gonna show you one slide to support this updated recommendation. And this shows the prevalence of bronchodilator reversibility in three populations, asthmatics at the top, patients with COPD in the middle, and healthy adults with no respiratory symptoms at the bottom. And on the x-axis is shown the degree of reversibility obtained in terms of the FEV1 after a bronchodilator treatment. And you can see straight away why 12% was used as the cut point um, on the basis that for healthy adults, very few would have uh, bronchodilator reversibility, more than 12%. And so that was considered a good cut point to use for the diagnosis of asthma. But as you can see from the slide, if we go to the top with the asthmatics, that many asthmatics did not have bronchodilator reversibility on a single day of testing. And so it has poor sensitivity. And if we look at the middle of the COPD population, we can see that many patients with COPD also have bronchodilator reversibility of more than 12% increase in the FEV1 
So it was likewise not only poorly sensitive, but also poorly specific as a diagnostic test. So when it comes to the diagnosis of asthma, it really is a clinical diagnosis uh, in which the greater the number of features that are characteristic, the greater the probability the patient has asthma, and it is worthy to then undertake a therapeutic trial. One of the many criteria by which you would determine the likelihood of asthma does include bronchiolate reversibility, but it is not necessarily a required diagnostic test. But I think it still does provide useful information to you as a clinician. Um, and although we are concerned in terms of limiting uh, the use of spirometry in clinical practice due to the risk of transmission of COVID, or in that case also for influenza, I think we also should keep a degree of realism that coughing is a far greater risk um, of transmission of a respiratory virus than spirometry itself. So I think we should still use spirometry in our clinical practice. It's just it's not a mandatory requirement in terms of making the diagnosis of asthma. I'd like to turn now to the second topic, and that is the preferred reliever therapy. And here the jury is in. A combination inhaler with an inhaled corticosteroid and formoterol is preferred to a short-acting beta agonist such as salbutamol as reliever therapy. And this applies across the range of asthma severity from the mild intermittent asthmatic to the patient with severe disease. And the reason for this is that there was a marked reduction in the risk of a severe exacerbation with the use of an ICS formoterol combination inhaler as a reliever compared to a short-acting beta agonist such as salbutamol as reliever therapy. Now in New Zealand, budesonide formoterol is the only ICS formoterol combination inhaler available, and it's available in two forms, the Simbacort turbihaler and the Duroresp Spiromax. Now I know that you're all familiar with the concept of combination ICS formoterol reliever therapy, but I did just want to reinforce it, that it's based on the principle that you're using the bronchilator or the reliever as the vehicle for inhaled corticosteroid use. And that in this way, you can titrate additional inhaled corticosteroid dose according to the need or the severity of the patient. And as an aside, I'd like to mention that I think it is deeply disappointing and depressing that it took over 50 years for the pharmaceutical industry and the respiratory academic community to recognize the potential benefits of this therapeutic approach and provide an evidence base for its use. The belief that one dose of inhaled corticosteroid would be suitable for patients at all times is incredibly naive for a disease that by definition varies by severity. And the analogy with diabetes is very obvious in terms of we would never consider treating a person with an insulin dependent diabetes with a set dose of insulin uh, throughout time. And I think the other thing we need to recognize is that it is the only way which we could prevent monotherapy with a short acting beta agonist therapy in patients who are poorly compliant with their inhaled steroid based maintenance treatment. Adherence has proven so resistant to all forms of education that the incorporation of inhaled steroid in the reliever therapy is the only way we can prevent SABA monotherapy. Unfortunately, uh, most of the evidence relates to the budesonide promoterol product, which is available in New Zealand. And just to take the theme of adherence a little bit further, um, there are many studies that have shown that most patients with, inhaled, most patients with asthma take less than 50% of their prescribed inhaled corticosteroids over time. And that poor adherence is associated with bad outcomes. And this is a study of high-risk adults with asthma from the United States, showing that within one week of a hospital admission with life-threatening asthma, both the inhaled corticosteroid and the oral steroid use fell to 50%. That the only way you could ensure that those patients were receiving some inhaled corticosteroid titrated to their underlying severity was incorporating it in with their bronchodilator reliever. So let us now turn to the evidence 
And this slide shows all published clinical trials that have compared bedesonide formotol as a reliever versus a short-acting beta agonist, normally either terbutaline or salbutamol as a reliever, across the spectrum of asthma severity from the mild asthma at step one through to very severe asthma at step five. On the y-axis is the risk of severe exacerbations, and 1.0 is the cut point of no difference between the two reliever therapies. Now, there are a number of observations that are very obvious from this figure. The first is that to greater or lesser, descent, or lesser extent, that in all cases, the risk of severe exacerbations numerically is less with bedesonide formoterol compared to a short-acting beta agonist as a reliever. The second is that for many of the comparisons, the reduction in risk is substantive, around the 40 to 60% reduction in the risk of a severe exacerbation. And the other observation, which is harder for you to read on the slide, is that for many of the steps, the comparison is not simply between bedesonide formoterol and, and short-acting beta agonist as a reliever. It is bedesonide formoterol and a certain level of maintenance treatment that is less than the maintenance treatment associated with a short-acting beta agonist. For example, at step two, there's comparisons between bedesonide formoterol as a reliever and no maintenance treatment versus low-dose inhaled corticosteroids and a short-acting beta agonist. At step four is comparing low-dose bedesonide formoterol as maintenance and reliever versus medium-dose ICS labor maintenance and a short-acting beta agonist as reliever. And at step five, the comparison is between medium dose bedesonide formoterol as maintenance and reliever versus double the dose of ICS labor and a short acting beta agonist as reliever. So this is why across the spectrum of asthma severity, it is now recognized that there's high scientific evidence that bedesonide formoterol as a reliever outperforms a short acting beta agonist as a reliever at the different steps of asthma severity in terms of reduction in risk of severe exacerbations. Now I'd like to show you this data in another form, in a more summary form, and this is a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, in which they've obtained a ranking of all therapy regimens that have been, in which comparisons have been made between randomized controlled trials. And this is the summary slide on the y-axis. We have the rank probability of the best therapy. One is the best and 10 is the worst. And on the x-axis, we have the surface under the cumulative ranking probabilities curve, where one is the highest and zero is the lowest. And this relates to the risk of severe exacerbations. And we look at the top right-hand side of the, of the figure, we can see that uh, low dose and medium dose maintenance and reliever therapy with ICS for motorol therapy outperforms it outranks all other therapeutic regimens, including low, medium, and high dose ICS labor maintenance and a short egg beta agonist as a reliever. And if we look just at the start on the right of the orange um, part of the figure, we can see that as needed, ICS formoterol as a reliever only with no maintenance treatment outperforms either low or moderate dose ice inhaled steroids as a maintenance and a short acting beta agonist as a reliever, or indeed low dose ICS labo as maintenance and a short acting beta agonist as a reliever therapy. Now, once again, I should point out that this is robust data from high quality randomized controlled trials, and it gives us the ranking that we need in determining what therapeutic regime we're gonna use for our patients with asthma. So the next topic I want to move on to is that relates to inhaled corticosteroids. It is now recommended that all patients should receive inhaled corticosteroid therapy. And I've already shown you data from the meta-analysis why short-acting beta agonist reliever therapy is no longer recommended. It comes bottom in terms of therapeutic efficacy uh, compared to the inhaled corticosteroid regimens. And that for mild asthma, there are two choices. We can easy use, either use ICS formoterol as a reliever alone, or we can use maintenance inhaled steroids plus a short-acting beta agonist. You've already seen that 
ICS Promotol as a reliever alone has greater efficacy than the maintenance ICS regimen. It is more simpler for the patient as you only need one inhaler rather than two. We know it is preferred by patients who have had a trial of therapy. As I mentioned earlier, it avoids short-acting beta agonist monotherapy in patients who are poorly or non-compliant with their maintenance ICS therapy. And just to go back to the figure I showed before, if we look at the left-hand side at step one, we can see that the reduction in risk of a severe exacerbation is around 60%. If you simply substitute a short-acting beta agonist like salbutamol with budesonide for motorol as a reliever therapy with no maintenance treatment. And I think this is incredibly low hanging fruit in terms of our clinical practices, that if you have a patient who's on a short-acting beta agonist alone, you simply transfer them across to budesonide for motorol reliever therapy alone. So the next issue I think we need to consider is how can we decide how to deliver this therapeutic regimen in clinical practice? And you will all be familiar with the stepwise algorithms in which treatment intensity is stepped up to obtain control and reduce the risk of exacerbations. And then after a period of good control in the absence of an exacerbation can be stepped down again. And that this approach can provide the framework of asthma management. So if we refer now to the New Zealand asthma guidelines, we can see that the preferred stepwise algorithm is the one that uses budesonide for motor reliever therapy. And you can see in the slide how it can be stepped up from one, two, and three if you, to obtain good control and reduce the risk of exacerbations. And then after a period of time, it can be stepped down again if the patient has been well controlled for a prolonged period of time and has had no severe exacerbations. So we can see that for step one, there is no maintenance treatment, and the patient simply uses the bedesonide for motorol as a reliever therapy as required, one actuation as required. Now, if the patient is not well controlled and is taking the bedesonide for motorol as a reliever on most days, well, then you would step up to step two, and you take maintenance treatment, either one actuation twice a day, or two actuations at night as the maintenance treatment, and then one actuation is required as a reliever at other times. If that obtains adequate control, then you stay at step two, but if you still need um, further increase in treatment to obtain good control, um, you then you step up to step three, which is two actuations, twice daily is your maintenance treatment, and one actuation is required for relief at other times. So here we have a very simple regimen based on one inhaler, used in two different ways, as either maintenance or as a reliever. And that patients can move between the different steps according to how much reliever therapy they are taking. And we know that at each of those steps, that the reduction in the risk of, of severe exacerbations is greater than the corresponding steps with a short acting beta agonist as the reliever therapy. So staying with the New Zealand asthma guidelines, this is what we call the traditional uh, stepwise algorithm based on short-acting beta agonist as the reliever therapy. And this was considered the alternative or the non-preferred option. And you can see straight away that if you look at step one, there is no option for a patient to take a short-acting beta agonist alone uh, in terms of prescribed therapy. That the, for the mild patients, they're prescribed two inhalers an inhaled steroid for maintenance use, and a short acting beta agonist as reliever. And as with the other algorithm, that the stepwise increase in treatment occurs from maintenance ICS to maintenance ICS slabber, and then to a higher dose of maintenance ICS slabber according to the severity of the patient. Now I'd like to point out that although the budesonide for motorol algorithm outperforms this algorithm at each step, this does not mean that all patients should be on the budesonide for motorol algorithm. That if patients are well controlled and have not had a recent severe exacerbation, they have good inhaler technique, and both you and the patient are comfortable with their treatment, they should continue with this traditional algorithm because it is suiting them well and they have, they have a history of good outcomes. <clears throat> 
However, if a patient is on a short acting beta agonist, they should switch across to budesonide for motor as a reliever. Or if a patient at step one, two, or three of this algorithm has poor asthma control or a recent severe exacerbation, then, then if you're going to practice evidence-based medicine and reduce the risk of a further severe exacerbation, you would transfer them across to the budesonide from motor reliever algorithm. Now, some of you might quite rightly ask, but what about the choice of the maintenance ICS labor therapy? Does it matter? Well, the answer is overall, no, it doesn't. And I'd like to refer to the landmark study from The Lancet about five years ago, which was a huge study uh, known as the Salford Lung Study, which they compared the combination inhaler of fluticasone furate plus valenterol with standard clinical practice. And if you look at the risk of a severe exacerbation, there was no difference whatsoever between the once daily combination FF valenterol versus usual care. So the message of this is very clear. It is not the maintenance treatment that is important in terms of the choice of which one. It is the choice of the reliever therapy that is the major determinant of the risk of a severe exacerbation. So I've shown you the New Zealand guidelines. I'd like to refer now to the GINA guidelines, and these are the international uh, consensus guidelines, um, which are updated each year. We published our guidelines in 2020, and we were, I suppose, to some degree relieved, but also pleased that GINA followed our lead in terms of the stepwise treatment algorithm, recommending two distinct algorithms based on different reliever therapies. So if we go to the GINA international guidelines, we can see that with the upper arrow, that the preferred uh, regimen used as needed low dose ICS formotol as the reliever therapy in steps one to two, simply as a reliever alone with no maintenance, and then steps three, four, and five with maintenance ICS formotol therapy as well. Uh, the main difference between our uh, stepwise algorithm and the GINA one was that we compressed ours into three steps for simplicity, whereas they kept theirs as five steps. And in part that was due to the alternative reliever algorithm shown the lower uh, arrow, in which a short acting beta agonist was the reliever therapy, which used five different steps um, depending on the severity of the patient's asthma. So there's consistency between the local New Zealand guidelines and the international guidelines in terms of the two separate algorithm approach based on which reliever therapy is used across the algorithm and with the ICS for Motorola reliever as the preferred algorithm to use. So we know what to do now. The question is, how do we do it? And I think that for implementation, the optimal way is through asthma action plans based on the uh, action plans that we used in many of the clinical trials that I've referred to in the presentation to date. We know that the use of an asthma action plan leads to better outcomes and reduces confusion and uncertainty. And I think one of the problems in the past that there was only one version that was available, but clearly one size did not fit all. And so now there are three different uh, asthma action plans that are available. And I know you're all familiar with the different action plans with the traffic light system, um, with three levels of well-controlled asthma, worsening severe asthma, and then the emergency, recognizing the severity of asthma based on the symptoms and the amount of reliever therapy that the patient is taking, and then the opportunity to write a predetermined course of prednisone in the middle stage for those patients who are confident to start it themselves, or the instruction to go and see your doctor, and then the emergency treatment at the bottom. It's interesting that this action plan with four stages is actually the one with the greatest evidence of benefit compared to the three and four stage plans, including the extra stage of worsening asthma and where the opportunity or the recommendation is given to increase the dose of inhaled corticosteroids from two to four times a day. Um, and I think probably from the data that we can glean from the clinical trials, this really is as much 
a behavioral change as well as a, pharma a pharmacological benefit. And of course, there's a separate action plan for bedesonide for motorol uh, taken as a maintenance and reliever therapy. And this is shown in the slide. And as with the uh, other two action plans, there's consistency across the different action plans that this likewise, you recognize worsening asthma based on symptoms and the frequency of budesonide for motorol use as opposed to the short-acting beta agonist use in the other two action plans. So there's consistency between the action plans in terms of the recommendations, but they've been tailored in terms of whether you're on a short-acting beta agonist or on budesonide for motorol as reliever therapy. Now, I think it's particularly important that we use action plans in terms of the budesonide for motorol reliever therapy. Um, because there can be some confusion or hesitancy of a patient to transfer across from their salbutamol inhaler, which they've come to rely on and in many cases overuse for very long periods of time. And so I think that when you're introducing the action plan and transferring a patient across or starting a patient for the first time on bedesonide from Otterol through the action plan, that you make a number of points to the patient. One is you make it very clear to them that the reason for using bedesonide for motorol as a reliever, and you'd refer to this as the two-in-one inhaler, is that it reduces the risk of a severe attack by between one-third and two-thirds, depending on the severity of their asthma. I think probably the most important thing you have to get across to the patient is that as a different from their salbutamol use, which they traditionally took as two puffs at a time, for budesonide for motorol, it is taken one actuation at a time, not two. And I think that's really important um, because the six micrograms of formotrol is roughly equivalent in bronchodilator activity um, as two puffs of the 100 micrograms of salbutamol. And in all the clinical trials, there was this dose equivalence in terms of the reliever therapy that was used. And you can use that to the advantage to the patient who may be reluctant to transfer across from salbutamol to be able to say to them that formotrol is a more potent agent, which is why you only need to take one puff rather than two, and that they will note when they try it at home that not only does it work as fast, but it works for longer. And you reinforce to the patient that just as they used to, um, as a guide to the severity of their asthma, note how many actuations or puffs that they were taking for relief, the same applies to budesonide formotrol and that in an emergency, you don't go back to salbutamol, you continue taking your two-in-one inhaler because that is the time in which its benefit is greatest. So the next topic I want to cover is that of precision medicine, of how we can individualize the treatment for the patient according to what has been termed treatable traits. And so treatable traits is something that is identifiable, it is measurable, it causes a burden of disease, and it is treatable. And the concept is that if a patient with asthma has poor respiratory health, despite what you consider to be appropriate treatment, it is possible or even probable that there is a treatable trait which may be contributing to their poor respiratory health. And this standardized approach gives you the ability to identify and manage these treatable traits which broadly come in the categories of overlapping disorders, comorbidities, environmental, and lifestyle factors. So if you have a patient who's on um, what you consider to be appropriate standard treatment, and they still have poor respiratory health, you should think, in addition to their asthma, is there something else that may be contributing to their poor respiratory health? Do they have features of COPD? perhaps relating to their smoking disease, and perhaps you want to go down more of the anti-muscarinic um, bronchodilator treatment pathway. Are there exacerbations due to bronchiectasis and they need a more antibiotic um, targeted approach to treatment? Is it due to dysfunctional breathing and you need to focus more with speech and language therapy or a respiratory physiotherapist? Or is the real problem with their asthma that they have uncontrolled gastroesophageal reflux or poor um, poorly controlled chronic rhinosinusitis. And in fact, that should be the target of treatment. And only with that treatment will the patient with asthma be adequately controlled. 
Is it in fact that they have environmental exposures that are important, which could be um, smoking or occupational exposures or even treatment? Or is it in fact a behavioral problem due to adherence or poor inhaler technique? So when that asthmatic patient comes to you with not happy with their treatment and their outcomes, and you think, oh, what am I gonna do next? What is the problem? Just think of a personalized approach with treatable traits and very quickly go through the different traits um, and determine whether some of these are worth investigating and treating in their own right, and whether that will lead to better respiratory health in your asthmatic patient. Now, no talk on asthma in New Zealand is complete without mentioning the, un well, the unacceptable situation with regard to Maori and Pacifica. They have a greater burden of disease. They have far worse outcomes in asthma. We know that there are barriers to good management at many levels. And we know that there are many contributing factors, environmental, socioeconomic. There are many comorbidities. There are many factors contributing to their worse outcomes. And so you need to look at a very multifaceted interventional approach. And so um, I think that if you have a Maori or Pacific patient with asthma, they need to be triaged into your group of asthmatic patients who require greater intensity in terms of following up their care and their management. You might ask, well, what is the evidence that budesonide formotol as a reliever is effective in these populations? Well, fortunately, two of the major independent studies of budesonide formotol as a reliever uh, were undertaken in New Zealand, funded by the Health Research Council of New Zealand. And in these studies, we targeted very strongly Maori and Pacific patients in terms of recruitment. And so we were able to undertake separate analyses in these populations as secondary analyses in these studies. And we were show, able to show that for both step one and step two for mild asthma with sole reliever therapy, and step three and step four for high-risk asthma with maintenance and reliever therapy, that the, the Maori and Pacific patients they had a similar magnitude of reduction in risk of severe exacerbations with budesonide formoterol compared to a short acting beta agonist. A similar relative risk of a severe exacerbation as the New Zealand European patients, but a greater absolute benefit because in fact they had a greater burden of disease. So we can be confident that we have an evidence base, uh, a strong evidence base for the use of budesonide formoterol as a reliever therapy and Maori and Pacific patients in New Zealand. So I'd like to complete my presentation now by uh, giving two cases, one at each end of the asthma severity spectrum. And the first case is a 45 year old man with mild asthma who thinks his asthma is fine. He takes his subutamol for relief a couple of times a day. He had one severe exacerbation with a course of oral steroids in the last year, but thinks his asthma is fine. And so you transfer the patient across to budesonide formoterol as a reliever. One actuation is required instead of two actuations of subutamol for relief as required. But the patient says to you, oh, they're not very happy changing across because they've grown to be really dependent and they like their subutamol inhaler. So what is your approach to this patient? Well, I think you should look them in the eye and say, if you transfer across to this new inhaler, that it will reduce your risk of another severe attack of asthma by two thirds, and that that is worth taking. And that in fact, they need to go onto an inhaled steroids of one form or another and ask them whether they'd prefer to take two inhalers, one twice a day and the other for relief, or one two in one inhaler just for relief only. And you explain to the patient that the two in one inhaler has a similar efficacy in terms of relieving symptoms. You reinforce the importance of taking one actuation rather than two as they've been taking for their salbutamol. And you mention the issue of potency and that as with salbutamol, the number of doses they take is a guide to the severity of their attack. So I think, as I mentioned before, this is low hanging fruit and we need to get all our patients who are just on a short acting beta agonist reliever alone across to bds from Otrol as a reliever therapy. The second case is across the other end of the severity of asthma. 
a 45-year-old woman with allergic asthma needs non-maintenance ICS labor treatment and a short 18 beta agonist as a reliever. And she's had a bad year. She's had repeat courses of oral steroids for exacerbations, and she's suffering from anxiety and depression. So this is where you'd step back one step and think, here's a person who's on what's considered to be appropriate treatment, who has very poor respiratory health. And so you decide that you're just gonna go through your checklist of different um, treatable traits and see whether there are some overlapping disorders or comorbidities or lifestyle and environmental factors that may be contributing to her poor respiratory health. And in fact, you go through this list here. You consider first of all, whether in fact her main problem is that of eosinophilic asthma and that a step up in treatment may be required. In view of her anxiety and depression, you focus on the issue of psychogenic vocal cord dysfunction, but you're comfortable that that's not the case. You consider the issue of bronchiectasis and you may actually take a chest X-ray and examine her sputum, culture her sputum during exacerbations to see whether in fact there may be more of an antibiotic targeted regimen. You take a targeted history for chronic rhinosinusitis and maximize that treatment that may be required. You consider occupational asthma as a cause and you check the smoking history. But at the end of the day, the features that you confirm in your treatable traits or targeted personalized medicine approach is you think that the main problem is that of her asthma and that she has poor adherence and poor inhaler technique. So you tell her that you think her problem is with her asthma, that um, the basis of her bad year, that she's high risk of a severe asthma attack, and you're concerned that you need a regime that may better suit her for when she has problems with compliance with her maintenance treatment. So you change her across to BDSNR for Motorol, the 206 preparation, and you recommend that she takes two actuations in the morning, two actuations in the evening, and one actuation is required to, uh, to relieve her symptoms. So that is the New Zealand asthma guidelines in a nutshell. I think in essence, those are the main features of evidence that you need to base your clinical practice. I think there is considerable consistency between the New Zealand and the international GINA guidelines. Essentially, they make the same evidence-based recommendations for the treatment of asthma in adolescents and adults. And I think the priority now is to um, implement them in terms of your own clinical practice. You know the evidence, which has been summarized in this presentation. You know the key guideline recommendations that have been based on this evidence. And you know how to implement them in terms of your own clinical practice. And I think if you believe in evidence-based medicine and your commitment to practice evidence-based medicine, you are now obliged to follow this guidelines evidence-based approach in terms of your own asthma clinical care. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Beasley. That was an excellent presentation. We do have a number of questions that we'll work through. If you haven't asked a question and you have one, please pop them in the Q&A. Um, the first question I had, um, Professor Beasley, is around assessing asthma control. So um, many of our viewers will be familiar with the um, ACT or the asthma control test. Is this something that we should be using every time we see an asthmatic? Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think the asthma control test is the test that is, has the greatest utility and the greatest evidence base in terms of um, its purpose. Uh, and I think for those patients who are literate, I think to fill it out in the waiting room and then present you with the card with the number on it you can read is really good. It educates them in terms of the things they need to be aware of in terms of recognizing their asthma control. And then it gives you a very clear beginning to your consultation to know essentially whether they're well controlled or not. Um, and like a lot of things in medicine, there's a bit of a gray area. We know that if you're 20 or above, you're really well controlled. If you're 15 or below, you know you're really badly controlled. And between 15 and 20, you're somewhere in between. Um, and so I think for those you want to, um, you might want to explore some of the questions, or you may want to then sort of focus on risk. Um, and for risk, we really use the principle that what's happened in the past is the best predictor for the future. So it's really things like hospital admissions, 
urgent medical visits, frequent courses of um, prednisone, or even frequent repeat prescriptions for their reliever therapy. Um, and I think that they're good, simple, um, very well validated markers of risk that you can use in addition to control to really decide whether you're going to step up treatment or leave them as they are. So we've had a number of questions about frequency and you mentioned a prolonged period of time or a reasonable period of time. Yeah. So once we've done our assessment and we start a treatment, how long should we leave yeah. our patients before we yeah. tweak their medications again? Yeah. yeah, so we don't actually know the answer to that question because that's never been assessed in a clinical trial. Uh, but for many of the clinical trials, the periods of assessment are somewhere around the eight to 12 week mark. So I think two to three months is probably an adequate period of time to give the new regime um, time to work, to assess it. Um, and But I think what we're going to see in terms of um, budesonide from bottle as a reliever, that I think we're starting to see in some new evidence from um, clinical trials, is that patients will become increasingly comfortable in actually making the changes themselves. Um, and it's likely that, that you can actually, as you implement the action plan, you can actually explain to the patient they can increase and decrease their maintenance treatment depending on how much reliever they take. Um, and that's a pretty simple concept. And I think we've found from many of the studies that that's actually what the patients are doing themselves. Perfect. Um, you mentioned inhaler technique. I wonder, do you have any tips or tricks around assessing yeah. this? Because it seems to be yeah. poor most of the time, despite you feeling that you've done a good job teaching them. Yeah, and I think that that's something that uh, it never ceases to amaze me, both in terms of my own clinical practice, um, but also in terms of the literature, that how poor inhaler technique is, even in a patient you think you've tested before and they were okay before. and. Um, it's interesting that the international GINA guidelines have been criticized for the number of times they've put throughout the text that you should check inhaler technique at every single time you see a patient. Um, and that the bang for the buck, it's like smoking cessation. If you ask a patient every time you see them, a very simple question, the bang for the buck is, is there um, in terms of the benefit. Uh, and so I think that there's something you do every time you see a patient. Okay, great, thank you. Um, thinking about um, treatable traits, so what would make you think that you need to delve into yeah. that a little bit more? What, what would the yeah. clues be? Yeah, so I think a patient who's got asthma, who's well controlled, and um, you know, you ask them how they are, and they say they're fine, and the ACT score is high, um, they haven't had exacerbations, uh, and they seem to be in good health. I mean, you might ask some of the other questions, like chronic rhinosinusitis. Um, as a standard for your asthma patients. But for those patients, I think you can, they, you know, they're low risk and I think you can carry on with the standard treatment. But I think it's the patient who comes to you and you ask them how they are and either, I mean, they may say they're fine, but they've got a low, AC, a low ACT score or they've had an exacerbation or they're using a lot of reliever um, or they've had urgent medical reviews. Uh, those patients um, clearly are not adequate. Their respiratory health is not adequately controlled. And we know there's so much overlap between asthma and the overlapping disorders that present with wheeze and breathlessness, the comorbidities that make asthma worse, and the environmental factors that are sometimes so important, like occupational asthma, to identify, or even the simple things like adherence and, and, and um, inhaler technique, that for those patients, you have your sort of your checklist, might only be seven or eight things. And you get practice in terms of quickly asking of each of the key symptoms. And you might do some investigations to follow it up in terms of sputum or chest x-ray. Um, and for those patients, you also escalate their asthma treatment, but you actually try to bring these other things under control as well. Thank you. Thinking now about peak flows, is there a role for ongoing use of the peak flow monitor? Uh, and what patients should we be suggesting should be using a peak flow meter? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's interesting with peak flow, they've come in and out of favor. Um, we know that there is a group of asthma patients who have poor perception of their asthma severity. Um, and they're often by people who turn up very late in terms of an exacerbation. We also know that there are patients with brittle asthma where things change very quickly. And I think for those patients, it's worthwhile giving them a peak flow meter, finding out what their normal values are when they're well, and then incorporating 
cut points at the different stages of the action plan in terms of this is another indicator that you may be needing medical review on an urgent or emergency basis. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, in the many and a long time ago, there was recommended that, you know, all asthma patients should have a peak flow meter and measure it all the time. We've got good evidence from the action plan randomized control trials that there wasn't much difference between the action plans that incorporated peak flow meters or not. So I think we can be more relaxed in saying we don't need to give it out to all the patients, but if the patient's got troublesome asthma or um, has poor perception and delay in an exacerbation, we should give them a peak flow meter and not necessarily say to measure it every day, but just say to them, if you get to a stage where you're using your inhaler more often, get your peak flow meter out and see where you are and then follow your action plan, get your action plan out at the same time and just work out what you're going to do. Great. That's a great tip. Thank you. And we've got lots of questions about stepping up and stepping down. So can you give us um, some indications of when we would consider things to be well controlled that we should step down uh, firstly? I think it's a, it's a combination of factors. Um, is asthma control as, for example, the ACT score, and it's severe exacerbation history and risk of severe exacerbations. And then probably the, the best one at all is actually the number of reliever puffs you're taking in a day. And I think if a patient hasn't had any severe exacerbation, they have few symptoms, and they seldom using their reliever, that there are people who could step down. Um, and... Um, but then when doing so, you say to them, however, if you find you need your reliever um, more often over a period of time, then step back up to where you were. Um, and I think what we're really doing in that is we're providing a framework and a guidance for what the patient's going to do anyhow. Um, but in fact, we're giving some guidance as to the way in which they might do that. We've got lots of questions about dosing and maximum yeah. numbers of uh, actuations per day. I wonder if you yeah. can just clarify that because there is some conflicting yeah. information across the different platforms. Yes, the answer is the same for both subutamol and budesonide promotable. That what is the maximum number of puffs a day? So if you're sitting in extremis waiting for your ambulance to arrive and you've taken whatever was recommended as the maximum number of puffs, um, that you, you're going to want the patient to take another one. Um, so I think, first of all, the message to the patient is that they should take the amount of reliever they need, but once they get above a certain amount, they need to take action while they continue to take the number that they, lead, they, they need. Um, and so for Bidesonide for Motorola, there have been two sort of cut points that have been put in place. One is eight actuations in a 24-hour period to indicate you need to go and see your GP in the next day or two. Um, and the other is if you use more than 12 actuations in a 24-hour period, that's a sort of an ambulance emergency call. Um, it's interesting that there's never been that same focus with subutamol, but the concept is exactly the same. And so uh, the recommendation, I think, should be roughly double those levels for subutamol um, as, composed, as, as opposed to budesonide for motorol, accepting there's that two-to-one ratio in terms of use. Great, thank you. I wonder if we can talk about inhalers now. Um, so the 206 is the yeah. uh, strength recommended in the guidelines, but we've had a number of questions saying, why can't we use the 106? Yeah, yeah. What's, what's the basis for that, please? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. And um, there's very little difference between the 106 and the 206 in terms of clinical efficacy reduction and risk. And that really relates to the fact that there's a very flat dose response relationship with maintenance inhaled steroids um, and asthma control. Um, and so for those who have gone into the fine print of the guidelines, you'll notice that the standard dose of ICS that's recommended as maintenance treatment is somewhere around 400 of budesonide or BDP and 200 of fluticasone propionate. Um, and so um, that's getting up to sort of um, 80, 90% or more of the maximum obtainable benefit and so that's why they're considered standard doses. Uh, and so um, for there's actually only a small difference in efficacy between the 106 and the 206. And one option you can do if you want to step down is to go from the 206 to the 106 and use the same number of puffs in the regime. Or stepping up, you could actually just change from the 106 to the 206. But at the end of the day, it's the reliever use that's really going to give you the additional benefit 
in terms of risk reduction. Um, and the same applies to maintenance ICS labor and a person on salbutamol as the reliever. There isn't a lot of benefit going up higher um, than the standard dose of FP of around 200 micrograms in the combination product or the 100 micrograms in the fluticasone furorate. Um, and so um, it's, it's yet another piece of evidence that the maintenance treatment, as long as you're on some, that's the main um, issue. It's the reliever that counts in terms of really the overall efficacy. Great, thank you. Number of questions about um, our patients who love their salbutamol and don't want to give it up. Yeah. So um, you've mentioned we don't necessarily need to swap everyone over, but if we've got someone who is on a um, combination inhaler, but they feel for acute asthma, they get better relief from yeah. their salbutamol. Is there a place for a salbutamol yeah. inhaler? Yeah, well, I think at the end of the day that we have to accept there is a individual individual variability in terms of responsiveness and so there may be a patient who says this inhaler is clearly better than the other one uh, we know from the clinical trials that it's very few but so you, i think at the end of the day you should always give the patient the benefit of doubt in that situation but i think for a medication where the number of, you take the number of puffs needed to relieve your symptoms that argument shouldn't really stack up because um you take you take the puffs until you get relief and we know that with formoterol, you get a duration of action that's longer. Um, so um, I think you should be you should be cognizant of what the patient tells you and allows that to guide you. But I think for most patients, that should not be an issue. Great, thank you. I suppose there's always the risk that they will just use their yeah. um, salbutamol, so not yes. having it there, yeah. then they won't use it. And, um, and if I could just add there, and this is sort of looking into the future, there was a fantastic study in the New England Journal um, uh, 15 years ago, this showed that BDP salbutamol combination inhaler as a reliever um, was at least as good as BDP as a maintenance and salbutamol as a reliever, and seriously outperformed salbutamol as a reliever therapy. And in the pipeline, there are a number of ICS salbutamol products that are now being investigated as reliever therapy. And I think when those come on board, the pay, that patient will have the option of saying, well, that's fine. We'll just put you on the combination that includes the salbutamol and you can have the same benefits of titrated and held steroid therapy uh, with your regimen. And so hopefully that issue will be resolved within the next few years. And is there a time lag from symptom relief with salbutamol compared to the labor? No. So I think that um, salbutamol and formoterol have very similar time courses. Um, and uh, so um, I think we consider them in generally as equivalent. Also the fact that if you take it for relief, you, you'll take an additional puff if you need it, uh, or two puffs if you need it. Um, I don't think that is a real issue for a medication that there's not fixed dosing for relief. It is relief as required. Just some questions now about other medications. So when would you use the Duorest Spiromax versus Simbacort? Yeah, so I think that's up to preference um, that you could say, well, the evidence is based on the budesonide from or tubehaler device. Um, and I think that was a fair call to make. Um, but there may be a patient who prefers the alternative device um, in terms of an inhaler device. So if you have a patient um, who has may have difficulty with the tubehaler device, well, I think that would be the patient you then try the alternative inhaler device. Great. And then uh, once daily dosing, a product that is just once daily dosing, is there a role for that? Yeah. So um, I showed you the data of um, FF Valenterol combination product that performs very similar uh, in terms of standard care with alternative ICS labor maintenance and a short acting beta agonist as reliever. Um, so, uh, so I think that the choice of um, maintenance ICS labor with a short acting beta agonist as reliever may come down to whether a patient may prefer once versus twice daily dosing or whether the inhaler device the patient may refer, prefer. Um, so I think that there is a sort of secondary issues of lesser importance perhaps um, than which reliever the patient takes. Fantastic, thank you for that. Now we've got lots of questions just stepping sideways for a moment before we talk about action plans around exercise induced yeah. asthma. We haven't talked about that tonight, 
but is there a role for a combined inhaler yep. in yep. exercise-induced asthma? Yeah, so uh, many of the studies used pedestinide for multiple breath for relief and prior to exercise. Um, and there's a study that has looked at that in a bit more detail as well. So there's both an evidence base and regulatory approval through MedSafe to use it both as a reliever and protection against exercise-induced asthma. Um, and I think, you know, some people used to think exercise-induced asthma was a sort of separate condition. You've just got it with exercise. Well, I think we now know that's, that's actually not true. Um, if someone has exercise-induced asthma, it means that their asthma is not adequately controlled. And so for those patients, um, getting a little bit of extra inhaled steroid prior to their exercise is probably not a bad thing overall uh, in terms of just titrating their inhaled steroid dose a bit more finely. And then if we are using a combined inhaler pre-exercise, how far in advance should we be using it? Is it the 15 yeah. minutes? Well, it's exactly the same as subutamol because the time course is essentially similar. Just some questions about epidemiology now, going around a little bit, uh, around epidemiology and the high rates of asthma in New Zealand. Do we know why New Zealanders have such high rates of yeah. asthma? Yep, yeah, the answer is no. Um, and it's incredibly disappointing. Um, there have been billions spent around the world in trying to work out the causation of asthma. Um, apart from knowing it's a Western disease that is uh, more prevalent, um, and more severe in English speaking countries such as New Zealand. Um, and we know there's a complex interaction between genetics and environmental exposures. We don't really have a satisfactory enough understanding to, for example, to be able to recommend specific public health interventions. Now we've got some questions again about stepping up. So, stepping up and adding in things like Monte Lucast. Yeah. Which patient should we be considering this? For, and should we be doing this in primary care or should we be referring on? Yeah, so um, I think for Montelukas has a good place for people with aspirin sensitive asthma. Um, for it's, It seems to have got a place at each end of the asthma severity, sort of for the very mild patients, some people use that as an alternative for people who perhaps don't want to use taking an inhaler. And in the very severe patients, when you've tried everything and they're on everything and you want to try something else as well. Um, so I think in a way, um, it's really developed a position at both ends of the asthma severity, um, but not throughout other than aspirin sensitive patients, um, I think because of how effective standard treatment otherwise is. Now, moving on to action plans, we've had a number of questions about um, when we fill in the peak flows um, and the recommended cutoff points yeah. for those. Um, it seems that uh, GPs, we may be a little conservative when we're suggesting cutoffs. What can you give us some advice here, please? Yeah, I think it's difficult. I mean, most of the plans used, um, as I mentioned, the one where you double the dose of inhaled steroids, so you had an additional cut point. Um, and I think the other thing with cut points is, you know, it's very hard to give a, an, a single figure for what's a continuum of severity. And so, one option, you know, you can use the um, you know, 70% or 50% cut points. Um, but, you know, if in reality, every time a patient dropped by 70%, they went and got, get a course of prednisone, um, that you'd be inundated with people um, come, coming to see you in that circumstance. So it's the cut points have been recommended based on the clinical trials of which the action plans have been used, which is that sort of 70, 50 cut point. Um, so I think that's a fair, a fair point a fair basis to start, but I think you should vary them a bit more in a range where you might say, depending on the patient, well, you want to think about it at this peak flow, but you definitely have done it once you've got to that level. And that gives you sort of more of a, a range of peak flows at which you may start considering. And then, but at this level, you must absolutely um, be seeking medical review. Um, and so I think those are the two sort of basic concepts. Great. I've got a question about prednisone. So again, Everybody seems to have their own regime for prednisone. Is there an evidence-based yeah. um, regime, please? Yeah, so 40 milligrams for big people, and that's over 70 kilograms, um, and 30 milligrams a day for smaller people, less than 70 kilograms. We do know the dose-response relationship. We, we do know that twice daily is better than once daily, um, but for simplicity, the plans say once daily. But for some of your quite severe patients, you might use the twice daily regime. Um, and the standard regime is for five days, but you recognize that some people can get away 
with a shorter course and some people develop a longer course. And that's why we gave the alternative in the guidelines that in addition to the five day course, um, which the patient may well stop themselves before they get to the fifth day if they're doing well, is 40 milligrams until they're a lot better than 20 milligrams for the same number of days. Um, and that has the advantage of overcoming the reluctance the patient may have to start prednisone if they think they have to take a five day course. That if it's a sort of a false alarm, they take it 40 for a day and then they're okay the next day, they get 20 and then they stop. Um, there's, we, we don't worry about adrenal insufficiency with a five day course. Although some patients do get a bit flat having had five days at 40 and then stopping. Um, so depending on the patient's experience that you may um, take 20 for a day just to give them a bit more of a soft landing. So I think the five-day standard course is probably a good baseline standard to start with. But I think based on your patient's experience, you may use a modification of that regime um, to actually tailor it to what the patient's wanting. And then they're probably more likely to follow it anyhow. Fantastic. So we've been talking about steroids. I wonder, um, just going backwards and thinking about steroid side effects with the high dose inhaled corticosteroids, is this something yeah. that we have to worry about? Yes, well, I think we do. And I think, first of all, um, there's very little benefit um, from inhaled steroids at a dose above um, 200 of FP. And certainly, the, the only benefit when you get to 500 of FP um, is, is the systemic absorption. Um, and so I think this sort of relentless increasing the dose of inhaled steroids um, is not good medicine um, because the side effects, including cataracts and the osteoporosis, um, the viscid diabetes, um, they're actually, um, they're real risks. Uh, and so, um, and also adrenal insufficiency, I should have added. Um, so I think that um, we should use the medication within the known therapeutic dose response. And we have addressed that in the guidelines by talking about standard doses, which is up to the 200 of FP and higher doses. Um, and so um, I think we should keep patients sort of within that range. Now, just some questions again about action plans. Um, a question about simplified versions of action plans for those who have intellectual disabilities or yeah. those who, who have English as a second language. Yeah. Can you direct our uh, participants to yeah. uh, a site that would cater for that, please? Yes, so I think that the foundation have translated the plans into um, I, I know Maori and I think Simone, I'm not sure. I think um, there's a, a basic Chinese that is uh, used for translation. Um, so, and they can be downloaded off the foundation website. Um, so um, there are some translated versions, but I think in essence, you know, management plans can be really simple. I mean, in essence, um, and I was speaking to some colleagues at a meeting in, in Vietnam recently, and where they said they had five minutes for a consultation, um, max. and and in some respects, this therapeutic regimen is ideally suited for a five-minute consultation. You say, there's the inhaler, take it when you need it. Um, you could give some concept of if you're taking it a lot, make sure you take a certain amount each day. And if you take more than so many puffs, seek medical review. I mean, that is the action plan. So I think that, um, you know, the old days when we used to write it on the back of an envelope or a bit of paper or whatever, um, I, think that's, I think that's still fine. Or... You know, what I used to do in terms of the management plans when I only had one version, get the big black felt pen out and put lines through it, you know, parts of it. I had some patients who would never double the dose of inhaled steroids, would never want to go and see their GP. They just wanted to know when to get an ambulance. Mm -hmm. And so you'd put a big black line through the, those two stages and just show them if you got to this point of inhaler use, um, that you seek an ambulance. Uh, and uh, so I think... We should, even though we have three versions, we should tailor them um, to our patients. Yeah, personalized medicine, I totally agree. Um, we're coming towards the end. I've just got a couple more questions, if that's okay. Um, yeah. About eosinophilic, oh. eosinophilic, yeah. Thank you, uh, asthma and um, the contribution to asthma. And should we be thinking about this and investigating it? Yeah, yeah. So. I think for the severe patients you cannot get control of, I think one of the tests you should do, I mean, you should do a chest X-ray, um, see if there's another diagnosis you're missing or masquerading. Um, it's worth doing an eosinophil count. And the eosinophil count is really high. 
um, you might do an IgE and see if they've got allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Um, so, or they may have that thing we used to call Churg Strauss, um, where they also get bad sinusitis as well. Um, so um, I think for the badly controlled asthma, really on optimal treatment, I think a blood eosinophil count, a total IgE, uh, and a chest X-ray are worth undertaking. Uh, and um, there's there's a lot of interest in, um, or perhaps also add a person with COPD. Sometimes you think, oh, should I put them on and held steroids or not? If they've got uh, an eosinophil count of 0.3 or more, they often do quite well of inhaled steroids in patients with COPD. So that may be another time when you take it. There was a big movement to try to get measurement of a thing called FENO, which is your um, expired nitric oxide. Um, and as a marker for uh, an active inflammatory process, it never really took off because the devices were too expensive. <laughs> and you know we can't even afford them in the hospitals. Um, so there's, a, there's quite a lot of the evidence of that monitoring the anti-inflammatory side as a guide to treatment um, is, is actually um, a useful thing to do if you have the resources. But I think what it's now turned into is part of your assessment of which patients get um, biologic therapy um, and whether they meet the criteria for biologic treatment. I think we've come to an end of our questions. I'd like to thank you for a fantastic evidence-based presentation tonight. It's been most useful. Thank you very much. And thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, and good evening.